believe it's been 11 years since Addicted. I can't. I mean, I kind of can, I guess. It's been a lot of things that have happened since then, obviously. But also, it seems like yesterday. So, here I am, back by request of, I think, six people. <laughs> I've been in my own head so much lately that I can't guarantee this one's going to be super interesting, but thank you. I wanted to get all these albums done um, by the time this next project, Puzzle, comes out. And so we're on the second of the DTP series, and this is the Addicted album. It came out in 2009. So let's just catch up. Here we are on January 5th of 2021. This came out in 2009. And 2021 is several universes away, it seems, from this particular period. I have not been as diligent with the podcasts as I would have hoped to have been. But my my thought process behind uh, the time it has taken me between each is I want to be in a reasonably balanced frame of mind before talking because similar to how I write uh, I don't think too much about what I say and what I write I just like to function on instinct or intuition and if I'm in a uh, an anxiety-filled state or a unbalanced frame of mind, what tends to come out is that. And as I had discussed in some of the previous podcasts, the experimentation that I had done back with Infinity and Alien and, and certain things that were rooted in, in not editing the thoughts that came out of an unbalanced frame of mind the ramifications of that for me were things that i just didn't enjoy so now whenever i do work whenever i write i have to gauge whether or not i'm in the right frame of mind to be able to function on autopilot and i i am now i think i think i mean it's obviously a very uh complicated and conflicting period but I was talking to a family member today about what it takes to get through this period and I think I had mentioned before how some people I know have viewed the 2020 2021 pandemic etc as being something that the end is just around the corner you know the end is in sight and I uh, have felt that the way for me to maintain equilibrium during this period is to view it as a marathon, is to view it as something that the energy that I expel each day should go into, first and foremost, trying to maintain uh, personal balance. There's that old adage you know, when you were in an airplane, you remember those? I have a vague recollection of them where they say, before you help anybody else, um, put on your own air mask. So things are okay. I guess here we are. Here we are. January having fun. <laughs> I've been writing a lot. I've been enjoying that. It's been intense. It's weird music that I'm writing right now, but I think that's in line with what I should be writing. As much as I would like to be able to come out of this whole period with a with a collection of catchy songs that, you know, I don't know. It's just that's not where my mind was. It's just been abstract chaos for so long now, for a year straight, that when I really dug into the work and I really started writing that's the only 
angle that seemed to make any sense to me. And so I've been working on it a lot. And I, it's fascinating, actually. It's too early for me to tell whether or not it's going to be a fantastic <laughs> collection of songs. But as a listening experience, it's just really fascinating. But I'll talk about that some other time. Here we are talking about Addicted. So what was Addicted? Addicted was the second album, as I said, of the Devon Townsend Project. I had come out of the Strapping Young Lad period. I had done Ziltoid, which in a sense summarized that frame of mind in a comedic, or maybe not a comedic form, but in a, you know, personified it into something that was goofy enough for me to get a perspective on. And then when we had kids, Key was the first record. And uh, that record was a, a bit of a paradigm shift for me in that it was a different group of players, a different sound, a different production style, a different drum sound, like everything about it seemed that if I was going to be honest with that particular period of my work, I would have to follow it to its logical conclusion, which became something that was very different from what I had anticipated and I think what had been expected of me. And it was a... It was kind of a magical period in a weird way, even though it was fraught with um, the unknown and, you know, a certain degree of fear and darkness. It was also a very romantic period because, you know, it's the birth of my kid and it was just everything was changing and I would cut my hair off and all these things. And so when I listen back to the key album, there's really something about it that I found uh, endearing and really beautiful to the point where when I started writing Addicted, I remember feeling um, a little disappointed in having to go back to that guitar sound and having to go back to that drum sound. And, and even though Addicted was a different aesthetic to what I had worked with before. It had a lot more of what I had been listening to during that sort of 2009 era. There was a lot of electronic or house music and, you know, Dead Mouse and Tiesto and, and a lot of things like that that were kind of in my sphere for whatever reason at that point may have been some people that I was spending time with or it was just more omnipresent. But I really liked the way that those sounds moved the speakers. I really liked how that frequency range worked. And I really liked the rhythmic aspects of it too. Fast forwarding a bit to Puzzle. I think a significant amount of how it works structurally is influenced by that time that I had been influenced by house music. In that there's... In a lot of ways, there's not really songs. Maybe there's songs that appear every now and then as a, as a theme or as an island. But overall, it's a stream of conscious. It's like a 128 BPM kick drum that just kind of goes and then things sort of appear and morph. And, and that's, in a sense, even though it's very different musically, of course, the inspiration for where Puzzle came from. I liked the idea that it was a constantly evolving landscape as opposed to the, you know, more tried and true song structures. I find now maybe it's because I'm up to my neck in the Puzzle Project as well. But if I hear a classic radio station, if it comes on and all those songs that we, or at least I grew up with, the 80s or uh, 70s. <laughs> now I realize how much of that music was just really repetitive, right? It's it's really cool, a lot of it, right? But a lot of it, it's like they take the chorus and they just yell it at you 15 times and then they end. And that was kind of the thing. And I think on some level I've I've pursued that, thinking that that was what music was 
meant to be. And I think addicted was the first time that I really started trying to analyze structures and thinking in the sense of, okay, well, how do you write a song? I've always written songs and music and I've had forays into um, compositional things that are more traditional, like life or Christine or any of these things. But it was always a fluke. It was always just because I had some topical awareness of how those structures worked. So with Addicted and coming out of the key period, I thought it would be really neat to experiment with writing songs. So things like Bend It Like Bender or, you know, Numbered or Super Crush or any of the songs that ended up being on that record, they were all really attempts on my part to say, okay, well, how are songs written? And I remember even looking it up. I was like, okay, well, songs that are popular, regardless of whether or not that was the intent, just I like songs, but I never really became a songwriter. I never learned how to write songs. So I ended up investigating it and saying, oh, okay, well, a lot of times it's, it'll start with a, an allusion to the theme and then it goes into a, a maybe a, an instrumental version of the chorus for half of a measure and then a real low verse, you know, like a sort of a down, not as many layers or, or maybe an acoustic guitar without the heavy guitars. And, and then the pre-chorus comes in and, and that's uh, a theme that is repeated to a certain extent on the second pre-chorus, but with a lyrical change. And then the chorus should be the big payoff and it should be the same every time. And then, you know, it goes to another verse and then, and then a chorus and then a midsection. Sometimes it modulates up a tone or, or it's just a version of the chorus that is played by the guitar and then a double chorus and then an outro. And I was surprised by how many albums and how many songs are just, it's that. There's variations of it for sure, but it's that. And it's almost like that Joseph Campbell uh, hero's journey thing. If you're not familiar with that, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, he was a writer that proposed a concept of, uh, you know, a, a storyline that resonates with humans to the point where if you look at much of the most popular media that humans have produced, <laughs> from, um, well, at least recently, like Star Wars or, or Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or anything. It's like there's this consistent theme that resonates with society. It's an interesting thing. And in fact, George Lucas, who did Star Wars, was uh, fascinated by that while he was writing Star Wars. So it was, a, it was an interesting thing. And it, it pertained, in my mind, to that same sort of algorithm in a sense that popular songs are written with you know there's this thing that really works for society it seems or it has typically maybe it goes generationally or 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 um you know every decade there's slight modifications to it or somebody has a, a variation on that theme that then becomes popular and then a lot of other people copy but I'd never learned it. Even before um, I started with my first recordings back with Strapping or Punky Brewster or Osh Machine, I mean, I never learned other songs. I think in grade 11, grade 12, uh, I, was in a, I was in a band and we played, you know, some Metallica songs and Living Color songs and Faith No More, things like that but I never was in a cover band. So I never really internalized how a lot of this stuff worked. So I was always kind of fascinated by it. And I was also fascinated by it because it works for me too. It's not like I was um, viewing these things aloofly, like, well, for the sake of scientific experimentation here, I'll learn this thing and be all condescending about it. I was like, no, I like songs. I wish I could write some songs as opposed to 25 minute long meandering 
you know, wank fests or whatever it is that I tend to, <laughs> and still tend to enjoy doing. I thought it would be a good skill set to incorporate into my process. So I started looking through it, and, and Addicted was my first sort of attempt at that. I think it sort of culminated with Epicloud, but Addicted is where I first gave it a try. And I really liked the sound of certain commercial hard rock records. And even though uh, maybe musically it wasn't exactly my cup of tea, I always thought that the uh, commercial hard rock records of that sort of late 90s, early 2000s sounded great on the, ra on the radio. Starting back with the Black Album by Metallica, it was just, they had those structures. Bob Rock basically took this framework of what Metallica was and then they put it into a, a, a structure. Like if you listen to Enter Sandman or any of these songs, it ended up just being these uh, defining moments for this band. They've got that structure. You know, there's the intro, do, 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 do. It's the chorus and then... The verse is kind of like subdued to a certain extent. And then it's the pre-chorus, sleep with one eye open. And then there's the chorus, which is the same as the intro. And um, I just really, it appealed to me. And then Nickelback as well. They were from Vancouver. And although they were much derided, the sound of their records was just really big. You know, they had... Um, Mutt Lang and Randy Staub and it was just a great sound and I always envisioned the music that I did to have that sound you know that big rock like commercial sheen to it and I always viewed perhaps presenting something that was different than what was commercially acceptable but with the same polish with the same sheen I always wanted you know, Ocean Machine, to have the same sort of production as Metallica. And I wanted Addicted to have the same sort of production as, as any of these popular hard rock bands. But I just, obviously, you know, how I function and where I sit on the spectrum of uh, commercial viability doesn't afford me the opportunity to work with those sorts of teams. So... I found Addicted was the first production lesson that I really started to focus on. I started to investigate how frequencies work and how a compressor works. And although I have been using them and had been using them for years and had made many records, it was all, um, you know, I'm just sort of closing my eyes and, and twisting knobs, so to speak. I didn't know what I was doing. Frankly, I still don't, <laughs> but I know more now as a result of starting to investigate it with Addicted. I loved the idea with this record of trying to incorporate those sort of dance elements and those sort of dance sounds, but with heavy guitars. And it was my first realization that those two things have a hard time interacting with each other. They're uncomfortable bedmates, and a lot of that happens in the high mid range frequencies, right? The high mid sort of 3K aspect of the guitar, plus how I record my vocals, plus the cymbals. All of these things take up so much sonic real estate that by the time I got the recording done, I just couldn't make it sound like how I wanted these things to sound. It was through the addicted recording and the next few, uh, realistically, that I recognize that a lot of why those records sound so good on the radio is because they're produced a certain way. You know, I tend to be everything at the same time. So in the chorus, in the verse, in the pre-chorus, in the midsection, it's the guitars, it's crash cymbals it's 75 loops it's a choir it's echoes it's all these things and then i think well how come this doesn't work and it's just because it's not produced to work there's no sonic space left 
Unfortunately, the way I tend to hear music is layered like that. That's just kind of how it's been wired into me for whatever reason. And recently, having had the opportunity to work in surround and Atmos, I realized that I can kind of get away with it in that arena. Unfortunately, you're limited to people who have that capability to listen, which sort of limits your your throw. But with Addicted, it was just, man, it was um, a very difficult production. The writing of it didn't take long. I wrote Bend It Like Bender in my car. <laughs> I remember just sitting on the side of the road and I had a guitar and, and I just, you know, came up with that and I thought okay well how do I approach this type of music now how do I approach this sort of heavier music again it had been a while since I had done anything like that and I had no intention of wanting to tour I had no intention of wanting to make a band out of it or anything I just wanted people involved that were I guess low maintenance and psychologically not um, invasive, I guess, for lack of a better term. So uh, having done the Devin Townsend band and, you know, that, that kind of ended strangely on a number of levels, but not, not so, um, not so dysfunctional that I couldn't call anybody up and so one day uh, Brian had called me and he was hanging out at Ryan's house and they were just playing video games I think they were that are watching boxing or something and when I heard them interact with each other I thought oh these guys seem to get along well and I would like to be able to have a rhythm section that doesn't have any you know, I don't have to spend much energy trying to mediate or, or coerce them to work together or whatever. They're just a couple of buddies that are hanging out and watching hockey. That's what they were watching. So I said to Brian, I said, you know, maybe you could play bass because you had played guitar in the Devin Townsend band. Maybe you could play bass in this and, and just see what happens. And uh, he agreed and Ryan wanted to play the drums. And so I got a rehearsal space and I had written the addicted stuff quickly and on my own. And I just sort of threw them the material. I said, here's the demos, here's the timeline. Um, I would like it to be fun. I would like it to be easy. I would like it to be danceable. I would like it to be sort of in line with these sorts of structures and, and sonics that seem to be appealing to me. And we rehearsed it. And then for guitar, I asked my longtime friend, Mark Chimino, to play the guitar on this. And Mark and I have been friends for 30 some odd years, maybe a little less. He's a guy I met in LA when I was working with Steve Vai. And to this day, we remain really close friends. You know, he's participating on the puzzle as well. And, uh, you know, he's a great guy. He lives in Long Island though. So I had him to come to Vancouver and we all rehearsed and having always had this affinity towards female vocals in heavy rock music, I was hoping to have somebody participate on that level, but I didn't have anybody in mind. In fact, it wasn't like, uh, I wasn't nervous about it, but I remember thinking, gosh, I hope I can find somebody that could fit the bill. And out of the blue, I got sent uh, a version of Hyperdrive that had Annika Van Giersbergen singing. So Annika um, is uh, a native of the Netherlands. And for years, she was in a band, fronted a band called The Gathering. And we were both signed to Century Media in the very beginning of the labels foray basically like there weren't many albums before we were on with the label 
I think it was like Stuck Mojo, Nevermore, The Gathering, and Strapping and Lad that were like the first kind of... Oh, and Tiamat and Samael and a couple other things. But, you know, that's right when they were starting. And I remember hearing that first Gathering album. I don't know if it was the first, but Mandy Lion and Borovoy, who uh, was the A&R guy and is currently Blabbermouth and a buddy of mine. We were driving around in his car and he showed me the demos of The Gathering. And I remember thinking, gosh, this singer is kick-ass. Because it's one thing to, uh, to scream, I think. But if you're able to project that sort of power with a, like a clean voice, which he was able to do with a really controlled vibrato, I remember thinking, ah, it's just such a great sound to hear. And so when I got sent the clip of Annie singing Hyperdrive, I remember thinking, well, maybe I should just take a, take a gamble and write to her and say, hey, you know, we met once or twice in the past. I'm doing this album uh, would you do me the honor of singing with me on it? And she agreed. She had just had a kid as well. And it was just one of those scenarios that we kind of, our, our paths crossed. So I had her come to Vancouver and we recorded all of her vocals in a week. I tracked the drums and bass and uh, the guitars at the factory studios, the same place that I did Key, same place I did Deconstruction and Ghost, all of the Devin Townsend project was done in the same place. And um, Sheldon Zaharko was the uh, engineer. I'm sure I messed up your last name, Sheldon. Sheldon, quote unquote, Dukes of Hazard was the engineer. And uh, it was a it was a fun experience, you know. It was a reasonably painless experience. Ryan came in very well prepared with his drums. Uh, Beave played the bass really well, considering he had never played it really before. Uh, Mark had never played heavier types of riffs, but you know he's a fantastic guitar player, and he came in and he woodshedded it, and he learned that technique, and and uh, and we tracked him. You know, the, the following week after the drums and bass. And I remember that once the recording was done, thinking, right, this is cool. I like this music. It's melodically interesting. These experiments that I've participated in, in terms of structure, in terms of all these things, are, you know, in line with what my objectives were. But then came the mix. <laughs> and I remember agonizing over this mix to a certain extent because I had actually contacted Randy Staub who had mixed Metallica and and uh, the Nickelback album and all these big sounding rock records P.O.D. and She Had and all these things and I said hey you know I got this record that I really could use your sound on but the price that he commanded at that point and rightfully so was just to do one song was my entire budget, basically. So I had to let that go. And I remember thinking, God, I can't do this. And all my rough mixes I would listen to in the car and it just sounded like shit. It was just thin and strange and undignified in a lot of ways. But then I remember talking to Mark and uh, when he was in New York again. And I was like, dude, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to... I don't know how to mix this stuff. It's too dense. It's too complicated. And how I want it to feel, as soon as I start to remove all these layers, it no longer feels that way. And he was just like, well, just take it slow and figure it out. And so I did. And I just went and I started one instrument at a time. I started with a kick drum and then the kick drum in relationship to the snare. And then the snare and the kick drum in relationship to the hi-hat. And then I'd bring in a guitar and then I'd realize I'd had to start all over again. And, and it was just really, really um, time consuming. And frankly, it was very frustrating. I think the record ended up sounding okay. It was, it was good considering I hadn't done that sort of work before. But I found that the process of doing it became different the further in I became, I, I got, I started 
recognizing that the frequencies that were all present in the symbols that we had chosen and the vocal mic that I had chosen and, you know, the keyboard that I was using, which was a Nord, they were all existing in this place that I just couldn't filter out without losing the whole vibe. And then I would get it into the ballpark and then I'd add the echoes or I'd add the bass or I'd add, you know, whatever, the reverb on the snare and it would all fall apart. And it was just really frustrating. So I started to quantize it really heavily. That was my, um, that was my solution. I was like, there's no room in any of this. There's no room in the guitars for the cymbals. There's no room in the, in the cymbals for the snare. There's no room in the kick drum for the bass. There's, it's, it's, it's beyond me. So my solution was to just make everything really tight to a grid, you know, like quantize the drums so they're right on the grid and then have all the loops that, of which there are maybe five or six loops in the chorus of universe in a ball or, or addicted, God addicted. The amount of loops that are going on in the background rhythmically were crazy in that. And I've since learned from that point that I can achieve a lot more of what I'm looking for now with a different guitar tone, with a different type of approach to the production of the cymbals to, um, the the high pass filtering on the loops and getting rid of a lot of those low frequencies that seem so gratifying when the loops are playing on their own but then as soon as the drums come in it just becomes this cluster in the low end that just sounds terrible right but at that time i just started quantizing everything making everything super tight to the grid and at that point as well i had started working with tune track the drum uh, drum easy drummer and superior drummer the they make drum samples drum machine uh, plugins that are the best in my opinion I love them and I still work with them and I use them constantly and it's a great product but that was the first time where I was able to say oh I could probably figure out a solution with this program I could make a MIDI track of the snare kick and toms and then do a sample replacement on that and then mix it in with the original tones. This is all old hat for professional engineers, but for me, I was just sort of freeballing it and having to learn as I went. And then I started experimenting with synthetic rooms and different types of reverbs. And then for the uh, drums that we had recorded, the direct sound was good, but I didn't like the sound of the cymbals and I didn't like the sound of the room for that. So I ended up taking the snare sound into the Armory Studios where I've done a lot of work. And uh, I ran the snare track through a big PA system in their fancy room. And then I mic'd up the room and then made a synthetic um, room sample for the snare based off of miking up that PA. I did the same with the kick. I did the same with the toms. By the end of Addicted, the sessions were just so convoluted. It was just such a crazy experimentation of how to try and make this sound even remotely like what my uh, thought of it being was. That was one of the most convoluted statements I've ever made. So I got... Uh, involved with Troy Glessner, who is the mastering engineer and remains to this day. I, uh, I like having a team when I work. It makes it easier for me to bounce things off people and, and to get, you know, more efficient workflow, specifically where, like Puzzle, it's so many moving parts, it's so much content that unless I've got all these sorts of relationships established artistically or sonically or, or uh, instrumentally, it just adds another layer of complexity that I could do without. And so establishing these relationships were very important to me. And Troy was first introduced to me when I was, I produced a band called Becoming the Archetype in 2007, I think, maybe a little later, 2008. And 
he was the mastering engineer that they chose and I liked his work. And so he got involved with key and he did a really good job. And so I approached him on addicted and I said, this is what I'm looking to do. It's different than what I've done in the past. And he was a real big help for me because I was able to send him mixes and he'd say, okay, well, listen, I think your kick drum's a little boomy. I think that the hi-hat's poking out a little bit much. And, you know, this is not something typically that a mastering engineer does. And, uh, you know, it was more of a courtesy on his part, but it really helped me at that time. And by the time Addicted was all said and done, by the time the mixes were done and the mastering was done, I remember thinking that although it wasn't exactly what I was hoping to achieve, it doesn't sound like any of those big rock records, it was still clear. I could hear all those elements. I could hear the choir. I could hear Annie. I could hear the kick. I could hear the snare. I could hear the toms. I could hear the cymbals. I could hear everything. And it may not be the best possible sounds, each one of those things, but learning about the frequencies at the time and the compression that I was trying to use at the time allowed me to at least have those elements present. So when you're listening to the record, you can hear what it is that I was trying to put across. One of the things that I also recognized during the mix of Addicted that was unexpected was a lot of these big heavy commercial rock records have a ton of compression on them you know like the limiting and the the mastering is just really really slammed it's like they call it a brick wall type of compression where it's just really really loud and a lot of the sound that i liked came from that but hand in hand with production that had that played into account while they were recording so that it all kind of worked in tandem. Having not done it before, when we tried to do that approach with Addicted, it just sounded like static. It was just all sorts of errant frequencies and all sorts of strange compression choices on my front that ended up just not working. So after extensive um, effort, we decided to make the compression on the mastering very, very mild, which is in direct opposition to the sound that I was going for. But it ultimately ended up being something that sounded cool. And I remember when I finally listened to Addicted, when it was all said and done, and I had gone through the arduous task of trying to make it work and all this, I remember listening to it and being uh, quite proud of it, thinking, wow, that actually sounds pretty cool. It's not... It's not exactly what I was going for, but it's got its own identity, and that's really neat. And as an album, conceptually, Addicted was, well, it was about addiction. And I've spent a ton of time thinking about the nature of addiction. And I think a lot of the reason why it, it was so fascinating for me is you know I've got a certain degree of an addictive personality like I I if there's something that I like or if there's something that I find pleasure in or 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 has been useful to me on some level it has typically been difficult for me to not just jump into it hook line and sinker but that same tendency to not know moderation has also resulted in the same problems that I think I've been trying to work out through my music and through my personal life for as long as I can remember. And the reason why it was so insidious as well is when we think of addiction or when I think of addiction, a lot of times you think of drugs and, and booze or sex or, or any number of those things. But it wasn't as much where I would think of things like work or stress or anxiety or fear. All these things that when you say it out loud, it seems absurd to ever think that you could be addicted to those sorts of things. I mean, why would one ever want to be consumed by fear? 
consumed by stress. And I realized at that point as well, and continue to, that sometimes it's the devil you know. Sometimes you just get so comfortable, like unconsciously, with this level of suffering. You know, like you have these patterns that you adhere to. You know, maybe you, maybe you are so used to being afraid that the absence of fear is just super weird. <laughs> and so when you do finally find yourself in a moment without that toxic thing, I found myself in the past, I would just be like, whoa, 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 I'm not used to this. What I'm used to is this constant state of anxiety. And a lot of times that happens with work too. It's like for years I would work so obsessively and so relentlessly past any productive point just because it was almost like self-flagellation. Like you don't deserve to be at peace. You don't deserve to be happy. And of course, that's not something that I was thinking to myself consciously, but looking back on it, I often think, well, why didn't you stop? Why don't you stop? And the only thing that I could come up with was, well, it's because you're used to this. It's almost like this weird martyr thing where you've got so much of your identity wrapped up in being the guy who's always stressed or the guy that's never got time, you know, and Whenever I gave myself the opportunity to do something else, I found that I would subconsciously just start to fill my plate with a lot of things, just constant work to the point where I was always the guy that was saying to people, oh, I can't, I'm, I'm working too much. I'm, I've got all this work. Oh, I'd love to, but I'm so stressed. And it became my thing. And it's a toxic thing too, to be the guy that is, always neurotic about his job. And then I started thinking about the nature of addiction in that sense as well. And, and how much of the addictive tendency sort of migrates. So at the time I had gone very hard line against any alcohol or any weed or anything. It was, you know, at that point it was, you were cut off. And I found it just all these things started to migrate to different areas that I would then become addicted to in a weird way, like worry, or I just started relentless productivity at this time. It was just album after album, after album, after show, after tour, after it's just relentless work. And it wasn't in a lot of ways because it was the most important or the most prudent or the most, um, you know, uh, wise business move or anything of that nature. It was just because I felt it's almost like in hindsight, if I stopped, then I would have to face what really the underlying cause of this addictive tendency in me could be. And I think the addicted record was really about trying to understand what that was. Well, what is this underlying cause? And clearly I'm no psychologist, but there is a part of me that started thinking, well, I wonder if this is a self-esteem issue. I wonder if you have this, uh, this lack of a sense of self-worth from wherever that may stem that ends up needing to be fed by this productivity because then you can be identified by your efforts. You know, you're the guy that has got 400 records out or you're the guy that's always doing this or you're the guy that's working so hard. Oh man, I wish that he wasn't working so hard. All these sorts of things, right? And I think it was really interesting because uh, right around uh, the time that Addicted came up, my grandfather passed away who I was very close to. 
I remember right before he died, he said a couple of things to me. And he was just like, man, he worked so much. He says, do you really need to work as much as you're working? And my first thought was like, yes, of course, I have to. I've got to pay for my life. I've got to, I can't go broke. I, you know, I have all these rationalizations. And I think that the music and the things that I was experimenting with, even with Addicted, these sorts of song structures, these sorts of production styles, perhaps on some level, there's a part of me that was just like, I have to make a living. I have to make a living. Now I have a kid. I've got to make a living. What is it that I can do to make a living? And as much as I like commercial music from time to time, it's taken until, well, now, or empath at least, for me to recognize that's not necessarily what you should be doing. It's an aspect of it. But to focus on that um, exclusively, it almost underlines this this sense of, like, for me at least, like a self-esteem thing. Like I need to be accepted. I need to be out there. I need to be valid. I need all these things. And I started recognizing that that addictive tendency that at one time I had thought was exclusively reserved for intoxicants, you know, like alcohol, drugs, whatever, was actually more of a mindset for me that I just needed to avoid thinking, needed to avoid being on my own, needed to avoid being still. I think that's even why, I think it's even why I started to really investigate the idea of meditation. Because it seemed to be not going away. It's like I stopped drinking and all of a sudden I'm smoking tons of dope. And then I stopped smoking dope. And all of a sudden, I'm making tons of records. And I stop making tons of records, and I start exercising more than is healthy. And I stop exercising, and it's just, it seems to just, there's this unrest that is in me that is looking for a place to escape. And that's where that addicted tendency seemed to be uh, just... I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. And so the meditation was a big step for me because it, it for, that's the whole purpose. It's like, you need to stop. You need to be with yourself and you need to be quiet. And it's, man, it's like, it was terrifying at first because the, the internal dialogue that comes up is, oh, I'm an idiot. Oh, I don't deserve this or, or I'm not worthy of this. And, you know, without my work, I, I have no value, you know, without, and lyrically, even this album began to dig into that, you know, you're addicted to your pain and it was, uh, it was an interesting step because I think as I've mentioned on a number of occasions during these podcasts is, uh, the fact that I don't consciously uh, determine the plan ahead of time. I just follow my intuition and my intuition seems to know in a very clear or a much clearer way at least what it is that I need. I think it's the same with all of us. I don't think that's unique to me. It's like if you can listen to your intuition, there's a good chance it is telling you what you already know, but maybe you're... you're your insecurity is just saying, no, shh, none of that right now. So when I was writing uh, the lyrics to this, in hindsight, I was like, wow, it's, you, you, you knew what it was that was uh, problematic here. And the idea with the Devin Townsend Project, the four records at least, was to take apart the past, take apart the, the albums that I had written before conceptually and without any sense of accountability I guess and then just sort of pull it back and say okay well here's the quiet thing here's the commercial thing here's the chaotic thing here's the mellow thing key addicted deconstruction ghost respectively and 
I wanted to sort of investigate each one to the best of my ability and, and see what came from it and see if I couldn't sort of rationalize it to myself where I had been and, and what had happened by making versions of all those aspects of my work prior that I still found compelling. And Addicted was, um, people seemed to like it, actually. This is one of the things that I found most interesting about these experiments. Epicloud, for example. When I released Epicloud, I was torn up about it because I thought, oh God, these are just, I, I, these aren't my structures. These are the same structures that have been used for generations. It's that, it's, this isn't me writing, you know, it's me putting a spin on something that is really typical. And then when they became like people really liked them, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, now what? I remember after those records, people at the label or management, they're saying, we well, need to do more, you need to do more music like that. You need to have more songs like Bender, more songs like Where We Belong or, or, or any of these more standard hold on or, or whatever. And I remember thinking, yeah, but they're not mine. This has got nothing to do with me. This is, this is the same thing that's been used for generations. And I feel really funky about participating in it. And that's ultimately, I think, where deconstruction went bananas as well. Like by the time I finished Addicted, I was so aware of how these structures worked and how that production style was meant to be that I was just like, oh, I can't do that right now. I got to do something that's like bananas. And I think that the project that I have done that most exemplifies that is probably the puzzle. This thing that I'm working on now, it's, it's, <laughs> it is not going to win song of the year. <laughs> but it's a good step, I think, getting to the point where I'm like, yeah, that's what I need to do right now. And knowing that by doing it, why you're doing it and how you're doing it is, is in line with what you should be doing is important now. But Addicted was the first of those. And I was, again, I was remorseful about not being able to continue with the key style. Because I love that sort of quiet, minimal, clean guitar, sort of spooky sounding thing which ultimately ended up leading to casualties of cool a few years later. But I also knew that going into the Devin Townsend project, the four albums, that it was meant to function as a collection of work, that none of the four styles were essentially like a definitive uh, representation of where I was at. It was all aspects of this whole thing. And um, as such, Addicted was what it was supposed to be. But it was also written so quickly. Like Addicted was just, I would wake up and I'd be like, oh, okay, super crush, dun, 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 you know, and the chorus and then all the, the parts. And it was just so, it was so like easy. It's like, that's how you write these songs. It's, it's easy. And, um, that was addicted and from there we decided to take Devin Townsend project on tour the first show the first tour that I I did with it actually was um, the Tuska festival in Finland asked me to perform the Ziltoid record in its entirety and so I just because I was working with Ryan and Brian and and Dave I just said, okay, well, we'll put everything on tape and we'll just do it simply and we'll get there and it'll be a good group of guys and it'll be simple enough. And that ended up being a 10-year touring cycle. So, and completely unexpected as well. Completely unexpected. Mark was back in New York and was just about to have a baby. And so I hired Dave Young to be the guitar player. And uh, he had been keyboards in Devin Townsend Band. 
And yeah, we went out on tour and, and Addicted was basically the beginning of where all of this second phase of my career began. I ended up parting ways with the management that I was with at the time and meeting up with Andy Farrell, who is my current manager during the Addicted cycle. And I met him when we did the Addicted show at Bloodstock. It was uh, the festival in the UK, Vicky, and, and it's, you know, it's one of the best festivals ever over there. And I hope that it goes this year, but uh, if not, I'll see you next year. But I remember that was the first time playing there and we had to fly in from Prague the day before and none of our gear showed up and everything was unplugged and nothing was working and the stage crew was, you know, the, the stage manager was screaming at us and it was just, it was a horrible experience. And we were already five minutes late to start and there's the audience and so I just went out on stage and started doing, you know, the most dubious comedy routine ever. Basically just trying to trying to keep people entertained. I'm just on the front of stage without a microphone, like going, hey, da, 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 doing some stupid dance and saying some stupid things. But I guess that was where things started to um, work in a weird way. I think that uh, the manager, Andy, was just like, well, you know, if you can navigate a scenario like this, you should be able to navigate uh, a lot of the other things that maybe would be stumbling blocks for people with, well, without kids. <laughs> I remember because uh, that was one of the first times that uh, I had been on tour since we'd had kids. And up to the point where we had kids, it was it was everything about my career and everything about the artistic process and everything about my creative mind and inclination was drama. It was just such high-level existential crises, always. But then after kids, it just seemed like, oh, this isn't a problem. <laughs> you know, what's a problem is going to a soccer game with other parents. That's a real problem. But not having your gear work on this festival, ah, we can deal with this. And the Devin Townsend Project was very much that it was a project i learned so much about what it is that i wanted and who i was and even the ways that i had established the the nature of that band was dysfunctional from the beginning you can't have a democratic um, monarchy you can't say i'm gonna do everything it's my vision i'm gonna write everything but everybody's got a say in it it just ends up being this weird version of, of what it was that you were trying to do in the first place. Same thing regrettably happened with strapping. And I'll admit it takes me a long time to figure these things out. So by the time I got to the Order of Magnitude band and, you know, Keneally and Morgan and all these people who I've been playing with recently... Uh, it was a it was an entirely different scene and and one that I have felt to be much more healthy as a, a as an organization. So, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, I admit this is not my best podcast, <laughs> the addicted one. I don't know if I was necessarily ready to talk yet. I've been really in my own head with the puzzle project. And it's, as a side note, it's, it's uh, interesting to me that I function so autonomously when it comes to these ideas. It's like if I'm doing one thing, it's to the exclusion of everything else. So when I was doing the podcasts and the live streams and everything, that was my world. And then all of a sudden I got into puzzle and that became my world. And, and it's just I can't seem to draw myself out of either side to focus it's like man i'm like so single-minded it's crazy that being said um it's super important for me to remain uh active publicly for a number of reasons not only because it's something that i think is important uh, as a way to say hey you know i appreciate the support but also 
man, if I get too much in my own head, I'm just, I just disappear. I can, <laughs> I can get so far into a project that even the idea of just like talking to other people just seems absurd. Like, why would you communicate? Why would you open your mouth and just squeeze air between your lips and have those become words that other people can participate in? Like, why would you even do that? But that's not a particularly healthy thing either. But we're here in 2021, 2021. Who would have thunk it? I have had a rough month and a half. And I know I'm not alone. I know a lot of you listening to this have had a rough month and a half or more. A friend of mine, a couple of friends of mine have just gone through some serious losses as a result of all of this period. You know, we weren't able to get together with our family over the holidays. And I see that the UK is locked down again. And it's really, really, really difficult to sort of maintain the psychological equilibrium that is required to get up and keep fighting through this, keep fighting through this. But we do, you know, and I do. And I found that the ways that I can continue to do so is to just do things for myself that aren't addictive in nature. So, for example, uh, I made myself hard deadlines of January 5th, which is today, to stop working on the puzzle for a week. And why? Well, because in the past, what I do is I, like I said, I go so far into the process that I get lost in it. And then I'm never really able to be balanced in my life. I'm not able to communicate. Like I said a second ago, I'm not able to be functional as a, as a father or husband or a, or a, a businessman, even if you want to look at it that way, because I'm so in my own head. So the way I've been structuring this period has been to set myself hard deadlines. I'm like, okay, so on the fifth, you stop this and you start that. On on this day, you go on Twitch, like participate with these people that mean something to you. Go see your 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 folks or call them or or whatever. Just get out of your head because it's really easy, I find, to after not doing something for a certain amount of time, rationalize continuing not to do it to the point where it becomes a problem. You know, like I know people that have such a problem with emails that they won't answer them. And then it turns into this thing that they dread. And then it starts to pile up and then people start to get mad. And then before you know it, it becomes a real problem just because there wasn't like a hard day where they're just like, okay, today we do emails. Today we do this. Today we do that. Whatever it is. So as difficult of a period as it has been over the past couple of months for, for all of us, really, uh, it's really important to me to be able to spend uh, the first half of each day getting my head together. You know, really focus on what it is that I need as a human being to be able to function. And, you know, there's some people that are functioning perfectly fine during this whole period. And, and some of them are my friends and I'm very happy for them that they're able to do so. But for me, man, it, it, it can be incredibly difficult this whole time because there's no answers. There's no real reliable sources of anything, really. It's just chaos and fear and, and misinformation and social media and, and, you know, the divisiveness between people at the parking lot about masks or not masks or vaccinations or not vaccinations or friends that I have on uh, either side of the political spectrum that are sending me texts and conspiracies and and you know and then kids and then not being able to go to school and then lockdowns and you know people that i know that are dying and then people who have died and and it's all it all 
comes together in this frame of mind that you're just, you're just like, I don't know what to do. But I think that in the same way as my intuition, our intuition, knowing what it is that we need to do on a musical level, on a creative level, I think if I really think about it and if I really spend time learning to hear what my intuition has to say, the answers that I need are there. And also without fear. And I tend to believe that the fear that I feel during all this period, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes is a pattern that I have established for myself over the years of addictive tendencies. Another example of that is never wanting to believe that something good will happen. It's, you know, it's like consciously removing emotions from a person, place, or thing for fear of its loss. And I've tended to do that too. But I spend the days prior to working now. It's like, okay, get it together, man. I start with some tea, do my meditation, drink coffee, answer emails after that, go for a walk, I exercise, you know, I make sure everything's clean, I make sure everything's organized, I make sure that everybody in my life that I'm responsible for, or at least, you know, my, my moods are going to directly affect, know that I'm not uh, thrown in the towel and then proceed with my work. And then that allows me to have, you know, a sense of, a sense of maybe control over it. But again, you know, you put your own gas mask, not gas mask, air mask on first before you help others. And so I admit I'm not the world's bravest person, never have been. But like the old saying is, it's courage is not the absence of fear. It's being afraid and, and proceeding anyway. And what I have found is that I'm not alone. Of course, of course. But I mean, with the proceeding while still being uncertain, there's many of us who are uncertain right now. But I take solace in the fact that other people are really trying as well and working through it as well. And so when someone says to me, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing good. I mean, is this situation good? Of course not. It's, it's profoundly complex and complicated, but I'm doing good because I'm choosing to do good. And I'm not saying that in the whole, you know, um, think positive life coach stuff. I mean, it's, it's really when I start going down that avenue of fear, it's like, how do you pull back from that and recognize that perhaps again, not all the time, but perhaps you're making a choice to go down that avenue. And there's certain things that I've found that really help. Exercise really helps. Meditation really helps. Not eating a load of shit really helps. That being said, while I was working on the puzzle last week, man, I just ate like, just ate like a heathen. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was the holiday season, which was super weird, super weird this year, of course, super weird, super fucking weird. But the one thing that it did bring was like lots of chips. <laughs> so I just would write all this super weird puzzle music and then just eat a bunch of chips and then be like, okay, dude, you're starting to feel slovenly here. You need to get it together. And so I set myself the deadlines and then I get up and I do my thing. And, you know, I'm getting by and I feel gratitude for all of this and for the people and for the careers specifically. Oh my God. 
I feel so much gratitude to be able to do this. It's, it's hard to put into words. And I had said to somebody, or somebody said it to me the other day, so I've been saying it to people who I feel uh, are asking a similar question that I did. When I started going down this sort of nihilistic road on my creative front, why do I do this? What is the function of music? Why do I even bother? All these sorts of things. It kept coming back that, well, you do it because doing what you love is an expression of gratitude. And I'm so grateful for this. I'm so grateful for the people in my life and for you guys, the audience, and for my folks and for the companies that let me have these tools that I can make my, my work. And I'm down to the, to the small things like, yeah, there's a lot of upsetting things to life currently, but man, I can walk, you know, my fingers work. I'm doing okay. I'm reasonably healthy. I'm, you know, I'm intelligent enough to function, <laughs> you know, like these things that seem like, I, you know, maybe I hadn't had the opportunity to be aware of how much I, I value these things and how much I value the people in my life whom I value it's it's funny how sometimes these periods of of trauma or these periods of unrest sort of strip away a lot of the the things that you maybe didn't realize at the time were useless and you're able to say well I'm really glad for these people and I'm really glad for this ability and I'm really glad for the count your blessings thing and I do So I will try to, um, I will try to set a hard deadline for myself for deconstruction podcast. <laughs> I've been in my head with the puzzle project, as I said, for so long now that it just seems like as I'm saying words right now, it just seems bizarre. <laughs> it's like... It's like, man, why are you even saying these things? Why are you even talking, man? It doesn't make any sense. But thank you. That's how I will end this. Uh, thank you not only for letting me do this. And I hope it's clear how much I appreciate it. But thank you for not giving up. I find that whenever I go down those avenues of wow it's a dark day and and i don't know what the future holds and and all these things i seem to be fortunately involved with people that i'll just talk to and they'll be like i'm like wow they're really they're working through this and there's really something to be said for that because it makes me realize that i'm not alone with this you know lockdowns in Vancouver and, and the kids and the kids are upset and there's no socialization and it's, you know, unhealthy on that level. But then you see other places where they've got it so much worse or, or if not worse, like just the same. And you're like, see, it's not just us. I think as a society, we've been trained to be so, um, our own needs and our own sufferings are above everybody's. To the point where we we can be forgiven for forgetting that this isn't just about us. This is the whole planet, to some degree, is dealing with this. Even if you're not dealing with it with lockdowns, or you know, if you don't believe it, or whatever your 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 trip is, you're still aware of it. So there's something unifying about that, even. But I am very grateful and I'm writing and I appreciate it and I sound like a broken record, but today's not really my best day for words. <laughs> my friends, this is Devin and I will be back with Deconstruction and Ghost on the next podcasts. By the time Puzzle gets out, here's my hard deadline. 
by the time puzzle comes out. I will have all these done. There we go. I have just made that uh, agreement with myself. And that includes, so what else have we got? We got deconstruction, ghost, epic cloud, dark matters, sky blue, casualties of cool, transcendence, um, empath, and I'll do one for puzzle as well. And snuggles, that's the other thing. Plus there's all those DVDs, oh my god, endless. Well, good night, good day. Please keep yourself together, and uh, lots of love. This is Dev, out. <laughs>